German first class, Lindsay Jackson. Yep, that's what it was. And you were at, you were with the A26 from? 1963 to 1967. I'm Jim Galuzzi. I was the uh, maintenance officer on the 26s as well as other uh, air commando aircraft like the A1, T28, U10, 123. But I spent the majority of my time with the A26s. I started out in 65 here at Hurlburt, the latter part of 65. Only spent a couple of months here when they transferred the wing up to uh, Alexandria, England Air Force Base, and moved the family up there at the time I was a first lieutenant. And then uh, spent um, about a year or so at Alex. And then from there, I got notified um, in February, I think it was, of 67 that there were problems in the uh, A-26 and to be prepared to go over uh, PCS. So I uh, arrived over there about March of 67. Uh, by that time I was a captain and uh, stayed there until April of 68. And came back to Hurlburt, uh, ran the flight line at Hurlburt and uh, had the A-26s, the A-1s, uh, which were the majority of the airplanes, uh, the T-28s. And at the time, that was the 4407th before they broke out the uh, A-26s in a different squadron. And we represented the uh, wing in the Air Force Dedalian competition, and we won the Air Force Dedalian Award uh, with uh, little gray ghost air airplanes, which kind of frosted some generals that didn't really want to hear that, but uh, we did that. And then later um, went to TAC headquarters and as a major and uh, then back here um, in 74 to 76 as a lieutenant colonel and then went on to the Pentagon and finished my career at the Pentagon. Very good. But, Can you just give a career history for us? Well, I started out in Commandos, Iowa. I was very fortunate when I got to Scott Air Force Base, they hadn't been in service a year yet, and they said uh, they needed a tweet to come out and said, one, air commandos must be E-4 and 5 level. So I figured, well, i give them a best shot. So I put in for it because I got tired of pilots and general's airplane because I worked for general and head of mats. And he says, are you crazy? And I said, yes, sir, I must be. So I put in for it, and in October of 63, I got notification, come to Florida. And I'm going, what? Why? What? And I was scared. I was 19 years old, then and didn't know anything. And I come down to Florida, and then the rest is history. I run into Carlos Christensen, and um, Carl, I mean, uh, Lieutenant Rosa was Lieutenant now, he retired as major, was my boss. And then the rest was like, okay. And then it, it got to the point where I progressed up when Curto promoted somebody over me. And then after that, he promoted me, sent me to survival school, and I came back, and I was his crew chief. And he said, oh, by the way, you're just made flight engineer, let's go. And we go to Florida, and my normal job is to go in and take care of the aircraft before the pilots get there. So I do that, I do pre-fly on it. I put the canopy cover on and I came back and the canopy cover was like loose. And I'm going, okay, we come back to Herb I mean England, we land. Both airplanes went in reverse and one came out and one didn't. So we went off the runway. It took us three days, to, well it took me three days to figure it out. We had on mark come up, we had uh, change engine, change pop governor, change the props and it still didn't work. So I said, God help me. I looked down the left-hand panel and said something's wrong. Well, somebody had took the big panel, the wires, and the Air Force, all the wires, when they put them on the aircraft, they match. They took the long wire and made it to the short side, to the short side, which is to the other side. So the reverse signal to go into reverse was the same, but it come out was different. I fixed that, and then the Colonel, when I went on a high-speed taxi check, and he took off, we did three touch and goes, came back down, they reversed it. And I said, okay, that's it. Nobody gets on my airplane after that, nobody. And then after that, it just sort of became, this is my airplane, I take care of it, go away. I don't need no help. So did you have one airplane when you were in the Confinam? Well, I, yeah. Well, no, my job in Confinam was a little different. I was an airman in charge of arming the arming area. When the pilots come out, they go on a mission. The gun people are supposed to come out and pull the pins. Well, guess what? They stopped coming. I pulled the pins. So I had one idiot officer, excuse my expression, he gunned the engine, and I had a poncho on. The poncho caught wind, and I went for a little ride, like a sailplane, like a sail. 
So I wrote the rules that were down at the end of the runway for the pilots to show me their hands and do certain things. I wrote those rules. So everybody had to follow them because I didn't want to get myself killed. From then on, that was all I did. I launched the aircraft. When they had a hot, when the airplane get hot, they would call out, um, people planes were going out on a mission. I'm the one that launched them. I pulled the pins, pulled the plugs, and they got them out, they all safe, and nobody got hurt, especially me. <laughs> and then I came back and went to Otis Air Force Base to go back to Vietnam on EC-121s. I didn't go. Tim, what was it, what's it, what's it like from your perspective maintaining those uh, rebuilt World War II airplanes when you were overseas? It was a challenge, but, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, to, to talk about how I got involved, uh, and flying and all that. I had been through pilot training, but got grounded. And so when I came to uh, the Air Commandos, um, they, on test hops, they had to put somebody in the right seat. And sometimes it was a, a QC, NCO. If they had a QC pilot, usually he flew in the left seat. So anyway, when I uh, heard about this, I went to the chief of maintenance and said, I've got a lot of flying experience. I'd like to become right seat qualified. So uh, they, they granted me that privilege and I actually held a flying slot, a crew member's flying slot in the right seat and became right seat qualified. And I went through the whole checkout program that the navigator would go through. I did everything uh, that the right seat guy would do except for navigate, but I knew how to navigate anyway. And then I got to go on a range a couple of times and, uh, op, you know, operate the switches and stuff. But generally, my, um, my uh, job was to fly on the test hops. I, I had accumulated well over 600 hours in the A26 in the right seat, uh, flying uh, test hops, a couple of cross countries, but mostly test hops, and assisting uh, the pilot. And there's, there's uh, crew member duties from both left and right seat. Uh, that have to be accomplished on a, on a test hop. So going through that checkout program and uh, being an old, when I was enlisted, I was a maintenance guy. So I, I had a, I guess, a knack for, for maintenance and knowledge of maintenance and aircraft and so on. Um, I became very familiar with the aircraft systems and, and tried to become as knowledgeable as possible so that when it came time to read the write-ups and talk to the pilots about problems with the airplane. I could help uh, with the, the diagnosis of what had to be done and what specialist had to be called and assisted with that and, and uh, was in the, uh, the management of getting the airplane uh, back to flying status. Well, you know, a lot of times, I'm interrupting, excuse me, but a lot of times when we did maintenance, it wasn't always easy, but we would manage to scrape and borrow and scrape and scrounge whatever we can get to make it run. We just made it run. We didn't, well, they didn't ask us any questions how we got it done. We got it done. That was an air commando philosophy. <laughs> you, uh, and I think I've mentioned to other people, I said, um, mentioned that, uh, especially at NKP, our wing commander, Heine Ederholt, was probably the epitome of a combat wing commander. I compare him to a modern day General Patton same philosophy, get the job done. Don't worry about the paperwork. Paperwork get done, can, can get done later. Get the airplanes in the air. And as a matter of fact, um, how I got to go to NKP from Alex, uh, we got the call at the wing that they were having trouble. A lot of the Big Eagle guys had rotated. A lot of the maintenance guys had rotated. And the Air Force was sending uh, maintenance people directly out of the pipeline with uh, hardly any experience. In fact, most of the guys had never seen a B-26 or an A-26 before. They had a couple of maintenance officers over there, a couple of captains. Uh, in fact, they outranked me when I got there. They had to figure out some way to have them working for me, even though they outranked me. Um, no experience whatsoever in the aircraft. And um, so the Heine called back to the wing and Heine knew me and uh, asked for me by name. And I had a choice. I could either go over TDY or I could go over PCS permanently for a year because I had a family and kids in school and all that. Uh, they made it a year's tour, so I actually wound up spending a little bit more than a year uh, and got to NKP. 
And I got to the base, and I had 10 days to clear out the base, move my family, and get to see uh, to Travis to get overseas. And I walk into the base, into the officers' club, and Heine was there. And he uh, looks at me, and he says, what the hell took you so long to get here? Get your ass on the flight line. Get me some airplanes. And two months later, I got my first day off, uh, working 12, 14, 15 hours a day. Uh, but it was a challenge. And it was good, good experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So when you got there, you had a lot of airplanes that were not broke, operable. But broke, was... broke, <laughs> big broke. I mean, was there uh, a common theme to any of the maintenance issues he had, or was it just everything? It, it was uh, a lot of engine problems, uh, which I later got involved with, with some corrective actions, some things we had to do to the airplane, modifications we made, um, instrument problems again things that uh, I got involved with, with the instrument guys, coming up with a fix. You want to talk about on camera the uh, fuel pressure fix <laughs> and the, uh, there was something in the air scoop, yeah. the carburetor air scoop, right? Well, the instrument problem, uh, and uh, <laughs> we had problems with fuel flow fluctuation. And uh, what little deflection you would get in the, in the indicators and the needles pilots would reject the airplane going down the runway and we had a rash of fuel flow fluctuation problems aborts and um, so I got with the, the instrument guys and I said all right let's let's find out what's going on here tell me how this instrument works and how is it made up and, and what can we do to solve the problem is it electrical is it something else so between the, there were three of us that worked on it, uh, two of my guys, my, my maintenance guys and I, uh, we uh, deducted that the, there was a diaphragm in the gauge and those gauges were old and the diaphragm was probably weak. So I said, well, what happens if we poke a hole in that diaphragm, make it a direct reading gauge? And they both looked at me and they said, well, we can do that, but that's really a, not a, not a, authorized fix. I said, well, let's try it. So we did that. We took um, both gauges and poked a hole in the diaphragm, reinstalled them on the aircraft, which was an aircraft that we were having trouble with, fluctuation. And uh, I, uh, I took the airplane down the runway and the fuel pressure held. Then we flew a test hop on it, no problems. And I said, I think we've solved the problem. I told Heine about it and he said, do that to all the airplanes. And I said, well, it's not really a legal fix. He said, I don't care. Do it. And so we did that. And we never had any more problems with fuel flow fluctuation. So it wasn't actually a fuel flow fluctuation problem. It was a gauge problem. <laughs> gauge problem. That's right. Yeah. So that, that fixed that problem. And, of course, we had a DCM at the time who was an old sack guy. And what little hair he had, he was pulling that out because, you know, the wing commander was telling us to do one thing. He was trying to get us to do things by the book and he says well I guess it's the air commandos will do things the air commando way and uh, so we pressed on from there the uh, other problem uh, I got involved with was uh, uh, low BMEP uh, going down the runway especially in during the hot months uh, and, and it was critical when you had a heavy load and so on you couldn't develop the power that you needed even with the water and uh, couldn't figure out why it was happening. Uh, we take uh, the airplane to the run-up area and it seemed to be okay, all the mag drops and everything would be within limits. I take the, the airplane down the runway and I really couldn't uh, duplicate the, the problem as they were reporting it. Flew a couple of test hops. And again, I got in with the, with the engine guys and I said, all right, what's the problem here? Why? Are we having these problems? Well, we're not getting enough air to the carburetor and the mixtures and all that. So we, we found out that between the carburetor, I mean the, um, the uh, cowling, top of the cowling in the, where the, in the intake to the carburetor, there was a boot. And apparently that boot was wearing and getting old and getting pliable. So what was happening is you were going down the runway and the air rushing through the intake it would collapse that boot, so it would restrict the air to the carburetor and you couldn't develop full power. 
So we, again, figured out a commando fix for that. We took some sheet metal and put sheet metal on the top and the bottom of the boot to strengthen the boot so it, would have, it wouldn't deflect or bend. And uh, flew a couple of test hops and then uh, put that mod on a, a couple airplanes with a heavy weight and no problems. And so, again, went to Heine and Heine says, do it to all of them. And, uh, DCM approved it and uh, so we modified all the airplanes. So we reported this to, through our tech rep um, to McClellan, who was the depot, who was the, the McClellan was the depot at the time for the airplanes. And so they had made a, a condo, a Congo mod on some of the airplanes, the air scoop. So uh, we requested that they come and, and modify our airplanes with that Congo mod. And that's what we ultimately did to the entire fleet and never again had any more problems with that. Lindsay, you got some stories you want to tell? Well, something sticks out in your mind in particular? Anything? Well, you know, we, we always had problems with the airplanes. And, and, and the thing about the airplanes is that as a crew chief, you're always looking out, take care of it. You hear things that aren't right. He can tell you the same thing. You hear, you hear your engines go off, you go, change plugs. Most of the time we change the plugs, they work. You know, and most of the pilots come out, no, there's something wrong with the airplane. No, nothing wrong with the airplane. The plugs yeah, are fouled up. The problem, uh, problem with that is that they run the mixtures too rich yeah. and they get a mag drop. And <laughs> I had my own way of curing a mag drop. And uh, I'd be right there, right there on the line. They'd abort going down the runway or abort the engine run up because of the mag drop. So i crawl in the airplane. And my fix was close the cowl flaps, get the engine hot, and shoot some water to it. And that would clear any carbon off the plugs. If it was really a problem with the plugs, then you wouldn't cure the problem. If it was just carbon, you'd, you'd cure the problem, and the airplane would be great. And uh, off they'd go. Yeah, because one day, I'm out there running an the aircraft up, and I had an exhaust fire. And Colonel Kirkdo was sitting there watching me, and the guy on the ground was going, Shut it off. So I run the first right engine up, and I said, no, no, I put the flaps down, and it started up, let the primer off of it, hold the starter down, crack the throttle open, and, and that thing bells and sparted, and fires come out the back end, and I lit it up, and I just blew everything out. And everybody's going, cut the engine. I go, mm, 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 I'm not doing that. And I blew it out. And I just, the flame come out about that far, and I blew it out, and, and the yes. will come out and said, let's go for a ride. Go for another ride, come back. And what happened? I said, I put, I had the primer, let the primer, hold the primer too long. Usually I hold the primer maybe about one, two, three, four, five seconds of the primer off and hold the starter down. That's enough fuel, but I overdid it. And, oh, oh. and he said, no, that, no. But the was, guy on the ground was going crazy. Because, no, shut up. I said, you don't shut it. coming out of the stacks? Yeah, you don't shut yeah. it off. That fire can go back in there. Right. Like my first thought was, I'm going to... You gonna, have to blow it out. They'll fire this puppy up and blow it, and yeah. blow it out. I mean, I that blew was, it out. That was <laughs> a problem with, uh, with hot engines. A lot of the pilots new to the airplane pilots that didn't have a lot of experience with that type of airplane would have trouble starting a hot engine and uh, primarily because they you're supposed to turn it nine blades at a normal start well on a hot engine you don't have to do that maybe three four blades yeah. and then uh, they would hit the primer too much and that would also cause a backfire uh, there was another cure that I did on, the, on backfires because the backfire would uh, sometimes collapse the old cowling um, because of the back pressure. So again, I got with the engine guys and we took and drilled a couple of sixteenth uh, inch holes uh, in the top of the cowling to let the back pressure out of there and it prevented uh, the cowling from collapsing until it was modified. Yeah, I can remember. But uh, it, was a, it was a problem. Uh, that's how you could always tell how experienced the guys were starting the engine, whether they can start a hot engine or not. And one, of the, one of the things about knowing where we were and what we were doing, I had, uh, my kids were um, 9, 10, 11 years old, and my number one son, my older boy, was uh, 9 years old when I was there. And uh, he was in the Cub Scouts. And then the family lived at home with my parents. Uh, and my parents kind of looked after, my father looked after the boys and so on. So he was a member of the Cub Scouts. And my father would take him to Cub Scout meetings and all that. Well, they found out that I was serving in, in Southeast Asia. 
they uh, chose my son to lead the 4th of July parade down the town because his father was serving in Southeast Asia, which was, it was nice. But it's effect, it was an effect on the kids. You know, the kids, um, I, I was told by my wife that uh, they were very interested in listening to the news every day, uh, to the news that was coming out of Southeast Asia, Thailand. They were looking for any news that came out of Thailand. They didn't know exactly what we were doing, but they knew that their dad was over in Southeast Asia, you know, in Thailand. So they were, they were concerned. Yeah, when my, my future wife, she didn't know where I was. My mother didn't know where I was. I didn't tell no family members, no nothing, because it wasn't in their business. And then the news was slanted. We found out when we came back home, we lost contact with the real world, because we come back home, and it was a whole different world for us. Different, it's like, what happened? It's like we went to a time warp and come back home, everything changed. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were race riots and people spitting in your face and calling your baby kills and you're going, what? So we, it's like, we were already doing the job that we were doing. That, Jim? Yes. Wearing the uniform around people <laughs> not being happy to see you. Well, I didn't, I wasn't, I went, I went home and uh, when I came back from Southeast Asia to pick up my family and come back to uh, Herbert here. I happened to be uh, downtown with my wife and my mother shopping. And uh, in this one area, there were a bunch of Yale students, which were very, very liberal. Yale was a very liberal college. And they were hanging the GIs in effigy and, and a bunch of uh, demonstrations and signs and so on. So I guess I flipped a little bit. I went wading right into the, gra into the crowd and just started swinging, and I guess I Caught a couple of guys and and uh, did a pretty good job of busting it up until the cops came and realized that I had just come back from Southeast Asia and they let me go and they jumped on the students that were protesting. When did you do your time at the Pentagon? I was at the Pentagon. Uh, let's see, from uh, about May of 1976 to when I retired, uh, November uh, 1st of 1980. And I had I had two nice jobs there. I I worked in the logistics side of the house for the first two years, where I was responsible for the budget and the modifications of all the fighter aircraft. I had pretty many, pretty much all the fighters under me were uh, in managing the modifications to the aircraft. And then I was selected for what they call Project Checkmate. Uh, we worked uh, twelve of us worked directly for General Jones, Chief of Staff. We were like his execs, and we traveled with him. And we were all ex-enlisted guys that had come up through the ranks, and that's what he wanted to surround himself with, for guys that had a lot of practical experience, operational experience. We weren't professional staffers, and uh, so we, we would travel with him. And his famous words were, go out there and find out what the troops are thinking and let me know. Well, you know, go back to what I was doing. I got out of service in 70. Went back in 73 as a security policeman. Ended up being electronics power production. Got out of that. Quit. Went back in the Air National Guard in 1985 as a corrosion control specialist. Went to school, qualified, ended up being, ended up going to recruiting. Ended up being a recruiter. At the same time, I was the director of recruiting for the state of, for the Civil Air Patrol for the state of Oregon and Washington. And then when I retired from the Guard, on active duty, I retired from Civil Air Patrol as the head of Homeland Security for the state of Arizona. And that, was, that was my military mm -hmm. career right so there. Master Sergeant was your final rank? Uh, in the Guard, in the Air Force, yeah, but I retired Lieutenant Colonel out of Civil Air Patrol. So I retired twice, you might say. And see, people don't realize CAP is auxiliary in the Air Force. So I went to the same schools, I went to National Staff College, Regional Staff College, and Squadron Officer School as a CAP member. I went to a military, but I was enlisted doing it. But in the CAP, I became an officer, so I got my degrees, and it works out for the best. Because to me, and I say this on camera, had been for guys like him and the rest of the guys teaching me how to be a better person. I mean, the commandos, I wouldn't be here today. And I owe everything I am to all these guys. Like you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I give them credit 100%. And I don't mind telling anybody, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't, I'd be dead. What helped me through my career was with the maintenance guys. 
I was an enlisted guy and I was a maintenance guy when I was enlisted. So I was one of the guys and they all gave me a lot more respect probably because of that. And uh, I had a pretty good career. I was a squadron commander twice, uh, maintenance guys, and probably held jobs uh, that were that would probably require more rank than what I was wearing at the time. But we were getting the job done.